welcome to today's cancer healing journey talks myself annie jos from community outreach team of zeronco.io and our hills cancer cancer healing journey talks helps cancer survivors and caregivers to share their journey with vast number of survivors and caregivers who have traveled or been traveled through this journey this can inspire and motivate them for their faster recovery aspect i would like to introduce today's speaker justin sander is a director actor drummer writer editor and a cancer survivor as of jan 2018 he and his wife mary lou sander opened three cubes Cube Studios LLC in January 2011. He is also a graduate of Indiana University and he has directed and produced cable TV in Chicago. Broad directed and produced commercials for ABC, Fox and Telemundo in Palm Springs. So there is a way to be get um introduction with me in front of here so which I'll be adding in uh, your introduction. So I'm really blessed that okay so you are here with us today. So If you want to start with a small introduction of yourself. Oh uh, yeah, well, my name is Justin Sandler, and I'm currently a resident of Los Angeles, California. I'm born and raised in Chicago, and I have been working uh, in the uh, performance and creative field for most of my life. I've been a musician since I was a little kid. Uh, professionally, I played drums, and uh, I went to Indiana University and graduated with uh, my degree in communications and theater. My specialties were television, film, directing, editing, and producing. And I got to work for a couple of years in Chicago, directing local television there. I got to work for a couple of years, writing and producing commercials out in the Palm Springs market for ABC and Fox. And then I made my way up to Los Angeles to pursue music, acting, and come full circle to create, you know, productions as well as a director. Uh, my wife and I have been running our production studio since 2011, and we do a lot of film and photography projects, including some works of our own, including a short film we made called "Welcome to Where You've Always Been," and uh, that came out in 2016. And uh, we did a big festival tour with that, and, and made a big difference. It's a, a fictional movie that I wrote, but it's about overcoming uh, depression and suicidal thoughts, and definitely message-driven content. That's Really, what I always strive to do. I've toured, you know, the world and recorded records as a drummer, and I've done some really amazing projects as an actor. Um, the 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 one that gave me my start, so to speak, was a film called Surfer Dude that Matthew McConaughey actually cast me in himself. I auditioned with him, and I got to do a few scenes with him in that film, and I uh, just had a great kind of run of of commercials and of. Uh, film and TV work, plus the work I was doing here in my studio, plus I was playing, you know, drums in several bands, and just physically uh, fit and having a very healthy lifestyle. I was uh, playing flag football. I was competing in gym fitness challenges. I've been a vegan since 2011, so health and wellness has always been part of my life. And so things were really moving very, very well. And um, I would say. I was ready for the next level. I was ready to really take everything I had been doing and even step it up to a bigger game, to doing more, to creating more, to inspiring the world more. And and that mission that I've always kind of held onto is is creating art that makes a difference. So that that's already been something that was in me and within me and my passion and my mission. And I thought like, here I go. I'm ready to to really go somewhere big with all the work I'm doing. It's all coming together. And then in 2017. As that was all happening, I suddenly developed some very heavy pains in my chest. Got very sick one weekend. Got basically, I thought I had the flu. I thought, okay, I'll just be in bed for a few days. But this 102.3 fever didn't break for over three days. The pain in my chest kept getting worse. I couldn't breathe. My head, my chills, like everything was just like I don't know what was going on. But I didn't have the flu, and so I finally. Went and saw my doctor. I got a CT scan because of the chest pain I was complaining about, and sure enough, um, they called me and said we need you to have, have you come in and see the doctor because we found a mass inside of your chest. We don't know what it is, and all we do know is that it's it's large and it appears to be growing into your heart, and we're going to be uh, referring you up to the top team at UCLA to go further with it. So just like that, everything I've been doing all through the years that. The whole life of creating and rocking out and all things I love and the mission and the passion and the projects I was getting ready to do, it all came to a screeching halt. I went and saw the top cardiothoracic surgeon at UCLA Medical. His name is Dr. Lee, and he got me going with every test under the sun for two weeks. I was doing PET scans, CAT scans, X-rays. I had a full surgical biopsy. I mean, it was really invasive and difficult to go through all the testing. 
and uh, stressful at that too, because I don't know what was going on. And we had all kinds of scenarios of what this could be. And I did get called back. And we're actually, now that we're recording this here in April, my this is the time of year when this was happening in 2017. So I'm approaching the five year anniversary. I went back for my appointment on May 4th for the Star Wars fans out there. I chose that date for my return appointment because may the fourth be with you. So we went back on May 4th and I got the news from Dr. Lee that I was being officially diagnosed with cancer. It was a germ cell tumor, which was a, a very rare diagnosis. No one even knew what that was, especially myself, but it was cancer. It was inside of my chest and this tumor had grown so big that it was 13.9 centimeters from its longest point to point. It was growing into my heart. It was going into my lung and possibly some other veins and, and nerves. They didn't know the extent of what was happening, but they knew that it was growing so fast that they had to do something very aggressive right away because they told me, we're not gonna give you a, a stage, stage one, stage two. There was no stage, it had not spread. But they said that the cancer is not gonna kill you. It's going to crush your heart before the cancer ever spreads far enough to kill you. And if we don't do something immediately, you know, you have who knows, weeks or months to go before this thing completely takes your heart over and there's just no room for it to beat anymore. So that was like severely shocking news. I didn't even want to believe that I had cancer, especially because like I said, I was physically fit, healthy, on top of my game, you know, daily practices of meditation and Buddhist chanting, vegan diet, living a very healthy, happy life, being creative, productive, not stressing too much always having kind of followed that policy to have this cancer diagnosis was a shock to me and to everybody. I come to find out that a germ cell tumor is one of the first, it's based off the cells that are one of the first cells to move when we're just little embryos inside of our mom's womb. So this was not a, a cancer that was caused by my diet or exercise or lifestyle or anything in the environment. It was actually a cell that was moving while I was just an embryo and it got stuck. And that's what germ cell tumors typically do. They're very rare, but when they do happen, it's because one of those cells gets stuck along the way and never makes it all the way down to the gonad. The, the function of the germ cell is to literally get into the gonad and determine if you were gonna be a male or female, and then to create the reproductive abilities. So the future egg and sperm are all created by the germ cell. So every human being has germ cells. Mine, the rest of them did their job, everything worked fine but this one rogue cell that got stuck um, in my chest area where my chest wasn't even there yet. My chest wall formed around this little cell and it lay dormant for my entire life. And one day something knocked it up, something woke it and it just started to create, it started to multiply. It was a cell with a function, but it was in the wrong place at the wrong time. It didn't know what to do. So all it did was start multiplying rapidly. And before I knew it, I had this very hot, very aggressive tumor that was multiplying at a rapid pace inside of my chest. And now we were faced with this diagnosis. <laughs> so this is where the fun begins <laughs> and where I try to make sense of it all. Um, with, with this type of, of cancer in men, it's normally found in either the brain, the chest or the abdomen. In women, it's often found in the ovaries. And so again, very rare, but mine was in the chest and uh, off we went and literally I had no time to think. They gave me this diagnosis. I, I left the doctor and went straight to my oncologist. Fortunately, before I left, my doctor's main assistant popped into the room and he said, listen, I know that's a lot you just heard. But you're the healthiest patient we have right now. Your diet, your exercise, everything you talked about spirituality wise, please just keep that up because if anybody's gonna survive this, you're the guy to do it. So it was really at least nice to have that reassurance that, you know, the diet that I was following, the lifestyle I was doing, had primed me to face what challenge would come. And that really is why I, I preach to this day, never wait too long to start taking care of yourself. You know, physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, do the healing, eat healthier, working out, uh, finding spiritual practices or other practices that speak to you. Because things happen in life, maybe not always cancer, but things happen. And because I had been putting all these things to play, when I got diagnosed, I was already healthier than the average person to deal with what was about to come in front of me. And I had this spiritual and emotional progress that I had been doing over the years that prepared me to face it and make something out of it instead of immediately just falling victim to it. 
And so I went right after my doctor to meet my new oncologist. Um, she loved her to death, Dr. D. I'm still in touch with her to this day. And she gave me the treatment plan, which was downright insane, to be honest with you. Um, they told me that they'd have to move me into the hospital and they had to start literally within days as soon as insurance proved it. And what they were gonna do is move me into the hospital and they were gonna install a port in my chest, which I still have a lovely star for those watching at home, there it is. And uh, that port was installed. It was installed on the opposite side than it normally is because the tumor was over here. The tumor was in my chest, growing into my heart and a little bit more towards the right. So they put the port on the left. And what they had to do is install three different types of chemotherapy and they would run 24 hours a day for a week at a time. And that was considered a round. So I would consume 15 bags of chemo every round with the goal of doing one week in the hospital, two weeks at home, one week in the hospital, two weeks at home, and keep repeating that for at least four rounds and testing periodically to see how the cells were reacting. If the cells reacted and they started to shrink off and die, this type of cancer, unlike let's say a lymphoma, that's a little more common, um, lymphoma with, with chemo starts to sort of melt and sort of go away. And they kind of, if you get over the, the lymphoma, you know, they, they call it remission. Whereas with a germ cell tumor, it doesn't go like that. It just dies and becomes essentially like a fossil, like a hardened little rock that remains and that has to come out. So they said, if it reacts to the chemo and we're able to, to kill and shrink it, we're gonna have to do a full open chest surgery in order to remove the tumor from your chest because it can't stay in there, it's just a dead hard rock. So that was what I was faced with. I thought this was absolutely crazy. I mean, I'm a natural vegan health nut and you're telling me, okay, you're gonna be jamming me with 15 bags of chemo a week for at least four of those and whatever else medication. And I was like, I was a hell no to that from the get go. I was like, I don't wanna do chemo. I said always, I would never do chemo. I would go the natural route. I had already started doing natural things from the get go. I started using cannabis oil right away because I know that the healing properties uh, of the cannabis is so important. So the Rick Simpson oil was the blend I was using. Uh, and I know that that um, that, that your organization does uh, have a, a wonderful section on the website about cannabis and everything. And I really appreciate that because it's so effective. And even if it doesn't you know, shrink a tumor away, it really is very powerful to deal with side effects, nausea and pain and, and things like that. So I was already taking some of the alternative medicines. Uh, I was upping my, you know, my diet, my alkaline water and all the different things that, that you know, is recommended a lot with cancer diagnosis. Uh, and then I had the weekend to decide what I was going to do. And the more I sat with it, even though I didn't want to do chemo, I realized that no matter what natural and alternative thing I did with the type of cancer I had, it wasn't going, if it, if it would work, it wasn't going to work fast enough. And there was no way for me to just try it and see. It wasn't like a slow growing cancer where I could say, let me try it for a few months. And if it doesn't work, then I'll go keep it. Like, I didn't have a few months to try it. I was literally under the clock. It was ticking, I had to do something. And I realized that I don't have the time to wait and I don't want to you know, try something natural because I didn't want to do chemo and then just be dead within the next couple of months. That was not part of the plan. I felt like I had too much to do in this world for that. And I really had to sit with it and I really had to go deep. And I, I used my Buddhist chanting. I used all the different you know, things to my disposal to really make peace with the situation. And what I ended up doing is saying yes begrudgingly I said yes but I decided that I was going to give love to that that therapy that chemo and I was going to welcome it into my body and I was going to just get there and get this done and so I said yes and by that next Tuesday I was moving into UCLA hospital in Santa Monica and I was there for a week and getting ready to start the journey and while we have a there's a whole lot to go so I don't know if you want I can keep sharing the story or if you'd like to interject a little bit on willing to answer some questions up to this point about what I've been going through. Yeah, sure. So I just wanted to know a little bit about your emotional well-being. So when you came to realize that, okay, so you're having cancer. So how was your yeah. emotion, emotions at that time? Yes. So the day that I found out that there was, uh, there was something of concern, that day I freaked out. I didn't expect anything like that. I'm like, ah, oh, there's some pain in my chest. I don't know, it could be nothing. I got a phone call from my doctor's office, from a nurse, to let me know that they, they discovered something in my scan 
and they needed me to come see my general physician the following day. My wife and I were actually in the car on the way to a shoot. You know, we, we have a photography and film business, and we have a, a big event that is called the uh, the Teacher of the Year Awards. And it's an event that we shoot every single year. It's about 400 people in a huge room, and we do the photography for, the photography for this event. And so we were on our way, it's an evening event, and the, and the phone rings, and it's the nurse telling me that there's an issue, that they need me to come in. I'm asking her, can you tell me what it is? She's like, no, you have to wait for the doctor. We get to the event. I let my wife out to go get set up with the cameras. I keep talking to the nurse. She says to me, the only thing I can tell you is that we've written a referral to a Dr. Lee cardiothoracic surgeon at UCLA. And um, I'm like, what is a cardiothoracic surgeon? And they're like, well, that's a, a doctor who specializes in illnesses of the, you know, of the chest, and the heart, the lungs, esophagus. And I was like, oh, wow. Like that, it hit me that there could be something legitimately wrong. And so I had to wait 24 hours to go see the doctor the next day at 5.30 p.m. I had literally to wait the entire day for it. And so I hung up with the nurse and then I had to literally like catch my breath, 10 seconds, put on a smile and walk into this room with all our clients and hundreds of people to be on the clock for work. And I was freaking out on the inside. And that was really hard to deal with. And for the entire next 24 hours, I was losing my shit because I really didn't know what it was. And that's sometimes like not knowing what something is, your mind can create up all kinds of scenarios. And I didn't know what it was. I was just like, I don't have time for this. I don't want to deal with this. I got too many things going on in my life right now. I don't have time for, for any illnesses. Um, I met with the doctor the next day. She gave me a little more information about this mess. It was like, it was just shocking. I was just shocked. That was really my emotional thing. I was shocked and I was frustrated. And it was the thing is I, I wasn't like a normal person maybe would be like, oh, I might have cancer and I'm scared for my life. My reaction was, no, I'm too busy for this. I have too many things going on right now. I can't stop and deal with an illness. Like I got my bands going. I had a national commercial that I was the lead actor in that like, was running all over the place. I had this film that we just finished touring and another film we were starting on. I got all these projects. Like, I don't want to stop doing these things. Like, <laughs> I don't want to deal with some problem with illness. So when we went through and did the testing over the next couple of weeks, it was challenging. Uh, I was, I would say I was scared. Um, again, it was a little bit more like exacerbating the first year. After about a week and a half of the testing and seeing some of the results coming through on the app, I knew inside of myself that it was a cancer. I didn't exactly know what it was, but I knew, I knew inside of me that it was cancer. And when I went to get the diagnosis, I already knew he was gonna say it was cancer. So I was much more calm at the diagnosis than I was the day I met my, my cardiothoracic surgeon the first day. The first day that I met him, I was like, I was all over the place. I was like, what do you mean it could be a cancer? He thought it could be a cancer. What do you mean it could be a cancer? Like, I don't have time for this. Why? What is this? And I was like, I was like all over the place and I was spazzing out. And I was like, you know, I just couldn't deal with the possibility of what it was, especially not knowing. But once I knew, and once I got the diagnosis, even though I didn't like the treatment that they proposed, I was much more relaxed that day. So emotionally, I didn't drop into any fear space. Like I said, I've been practicing spirituality, like Buddhist chanting, meditation. I've been going to emotional healing retreats for several years, shamanic healing retreats. Like I've been putting in the work. My wife and I did a lot of it together. And so when this happened, it didn't, it didn't just knock me over. I literally sat down and I said, okay, let's make sense of this. And so what I was able to do is instead of just becoming like this total victim to what was happening, I dropped into myself and I started to chant and I just kept going and I just started to process everything and I let I just let it into me and I started to accept it I started to say okay I don't want to stop my career I don't want to stop my life whatever this is I'm just gonna I'm gonna deal with it and I'm gonna get through it and I'm gonna be better than ever and I'm gonna come out strong on the other side and that was my determination from the get -go. there was there was zero doubt in my mind that I would survive I didn't know how serious this was. I never even looked it up. I didn't Google it. I didn't research it. Like they gave me a diagnosis. My numbers were off the charts. Like 
I knew that it was creating havoc inside of my chest. But I didn't do any further research. I just knew that right then and there that I would be a survivor and that I would be able to, to help others and have a better life somehow because of it. And I dedicate so much to that because of my practices. The day, two days before I was to move into the hospital, I got together with the local Buddhist group that I'm part of. And they were all chanting together for my health, for my victory. And I went and met up with them and while they were all there together for three hours chanting just for me. It was such an honor to show up. And I sat there in the front of the room and I chanted along and I just felt their voices. I felt their energy. And I really just dropped in and I just opened myself to receive. Whatever this is, whatever this means, show me the way. And I just opened it up to surrender. And when I did that, I was blessed with a powerful message that just started to download. And it was embrace your cancer, love your cancer, free your cancer. I didn't know what that meant, but I started to really like grab onto it. What if I embrace this? And what if I love this? And that became like, oh my gosh, this is, this is something. I have cancer, but I don't have to fight it or beat it or go to war with it. I can love it. I can spin this on its head and have a totally different perspective than I've ever heard of or seen before. And I can say, this might be my life's biggest obstacle, but I'm going to turn it into my life's greatest opportunity. And so I started to look at my cancer as a gift instead of a curse. And that is how I started my chemo. That's how I started round one. I went into the hospital saying, you know what? I don't have to like this, but I'm gonna embrace and accept this wholeheartedly. And you know what? I'm gonna take a different approach and I'm gonna say, I love that I have cancer. I love my tumor and I love my chemo. And I would sit there and I'd look at the chemo bags in the hospital and I would literally, like I would chant to the bags and I would send energy to the chemo drugs and I'd send love and energy and gratitude. So I just, I decided like, literally I, I have cancer. There's nothing I can do about that fact. I can't change that. The sooner like I accept that I can't change the fact that I have cancer and I have to deal with it, the sooner I can make a decision on how I'm going to face it. And really, once you do that, there's like only two options. There's victim, let it happen to me, woe is me, poor me, I hope I survive. Or victor, I'm going to take this and make it something special. Live or die, I am going to use this to catapult my life and my karma and my mission, and I have an opportunity. So I decided that that's the road I was going to take. Because once again, I had cancer, I couldn't wish it away, I couldn't close my eyes and pretend it wasn't there. It was there and it was growing still. So I said, I'm going to love. And I really dropped into this heart space, of embracing and loving cancer, embracing and loving the chemo, giving gratitude every single day, no matter what, to the journey, to the process. In the hospital every morning I woke up, I did all of my practices, you know, meditating, chanting, journaling, reading inspirational books, listening to inspirational audio, listening to binaural beats and high frequencies, taking my cannabis oil, I never stopped doing that, by the way. I brought my cannabis oil into the hospital with me and I used it right alongside of my chemo. And I said, this is the way I'm gonna do it. And my wife encouraged me to keep turning on my camera and doing live videos for Facebook and YouTube to share what I was going through, good, bad, and ugly. And I just kept sharing and sharing and sharing. And I would share about realizations I was making or things I was learning about myself or very vulnerable shares. And I started getting feedback from people saying, Justin, keep sharing because I'm being helped so much by your words that I'm going through this with you. And no, I don't have cancer, but you're helping me face whatever situation I'm facing. And that really like turned me on to the fact that I was onto something. And when people would reach out and say, hey, you've got this, you're gonna beat this, man, kick cancer's ass. I started to, to educate people on a different way of speaking. That's not the dialogue I'm gonna use. I'm not gonna go to war with something inside of me. I'm not going to hate or be violent to my own selves. Right? This is my cell. He may, may have gotten lost. He may be in the wrong place at the wrong time, but it's a cell. It's not good. He's not bad. It's just a cell that's trying to do what it was supposed to do when it was just a little thing. And I can't fault. Him. And I'm not going to put negative energy towards my own body, towards my own cells. And I'm instead, I'm going to say, you know what? It's part of me and who I am. So I'm going to love it, embrace it, learn from it, and let it go. And that was the mission that I kept. 
And that is what kept me going all the way through. And things got really hard. You know, like it wasn't easy. Like, just because I had the right philosophy and mindset, it doesn't mean it was easy. I suffered. I lost all my hair. You know, I lost weight. I, I kept working out in the hospital, doing laps every day, bringing my little stretchy bands and my exercise equipment and doing whatever I could to keep myself going. But it took a toll on me, but it kicked my butt really hard. I did go through the whole thing though. I got testing throughout. And every time I did my testing, the doctors were like, whatever you're doing, you're ahead of the game. We hope you would be here and you're all the way here. So I think because between my my practice, my philosophy, my practices, you know, I would visualize, I would visualize the tumor slowly going to sleep and disappearing. Instead of violence and, and fights, I would visualize all the little cells finally saying, oh, okay, we can go now. And I would tell, you know, to my tumor, I would literally, I would, I would hold my chest, I would hug myself, and I would say, I love you, and I'm so grateful for you. But it's time to go, because we both can't survive. I know you're not in the right place, in the right time, but you still did your job. In fact, you're doing an even bigger job than you may ever have been programmed to do. Because look at me now, we're changing the world because of you. You're my teacher, you're my mentor, and I really appreciate your gift. Also, we both can't live. So I need you to let go. And I kept giving my, my tumor permission to let go. And I visualized all the little cells slowly just smiling and closing its eyes and dripping off the tumor. And I would visualize this every day, all the little cells dripping away, falling asleep, and gently and peacefully going. And between that and the chemo and cannabis and everything else I was doing with my diet, I was ahead of the game. By the time we finished the fourth round, there was no sign of cancer left. All there was was a little hardened fossil like they said there would be. They said, okay, we got it, but we got to go in there and get rid of it now. So we set up the surgery. Now, like, it was crazy because right before my surgery, I ended up from all the chemo, my, my platelet count, which was supposed to be um, uh, right between 150 to 450 units. Uh, it's like times, times a thousand, but they measure it by the units supposed to be in that range. I did all my pre-op blood work and my platelet count was actually three, not 300, three. So I was hospitalized, I received blood transfusions and my surgery got postponed because it wasn't safe enough for me to have surgery. It wasn't even safe enough for me to be walking out on the street because I could bleed out from the inside if I even like bumped my myself. So after some of, some of that and the trial and tribulation of getting my, my blood count back up, my surgery was scheduled. It was August 4th of that year in 2017. I went into UCLA hospital for an eight hour surgery where they sawed me open all the way from under my neck bone, under my collarbone, all the way down to the top of my abs. They opened me up and within that surgery, when I woke up that night, it was in the ICU, I learned that they did get the tumor out and all, all the parts of it. But along with it, they had to remove the entire inside wall of my heart's pericardial sac which is about 15 centimeters square. They replaced that with a big patch of what's called Gore-Tex, which is like a rubber material. It's made in sometimes raincoats and gym shoes. So literally my heart, my heart's pericardial sac is patched with this material. My right lung, the, the tumor was attached as well. So they had to take out the first and second lobe of my right lung completely, but couldn't, couldn't replace those. They also had to rebuild my superior vena cava vein, which is the largest vein in the body that drains the entire upper body to the heart. The tumor was stuck to that vein. They had to remove that vein. He can't live without it. So they built me a brand new superior vena cava vein using bovine heart tissue. So I literally woke up from surgery, heart cow. <laughs> that was pretty shocking. I've been a vegan a long time. And so to wake up and find out I was now part cow <laughs> was a little bit much. Like I, I had this, this running joke, like, wait, if I ever eat meat again, would I be a cannibal? <laughs> so uh, I had to accept it. I gave gratitude to the cow say, okay, well, I, I'm so thankful that this is part of me. It helped to save me. So that surgery was a lot. I was in the ICU for a week. I was finally released. I spent the next two months in a hospital bed in my house. I couldn't do anything. My wife, my caregiver, my beloved was there from day one. She helped me. She stood by me. She encouraged me. She did everything and then some that a caregiver could do as a cheerleader. And I love her so much for that. And there I was, you know, she was caring for me while I was in this hospital bed in the room. But after two months, I was given the all clear to get up and start to do 
some of my physical sort of activity again, a little bit of rehab. And so I started to do walks, I started to move. I'm like, okay, I'm on the other side of cancer. I'm doing my live videos. I'm like, I did it, I'm on the other side. I'm gonna show the world now how you come back from cancer stronger than ever. And because that's me, I'm crazy like that. I just wanna help people and inspire people. So my goal is to inspire everybody through that. And so I started for a few weeks doing my little bit of physical therapy and everything else. And then I started having some breathing issues one day. It kind of a weird feeling that was kind of going up into my throat from my chest. It got so kind of concerning that I went to the ER. I was there at the ER for eight, nine hours. They thought I had a blood clot. It wasn't the case. They said, well, we see a little inflammation around your heart. We don't think it's too serious, but please follow up with your doctor. So I did about a week later, my doctor listened to my heart. She determined that something sounded a little off. She referred me to a cardio thrust, not a, a cardiologist. A week later, I saw the cardiologist. He listened to my heart and said, you know, I'm hearing a little something that's off as well. I want to get an echocardiogram done for you. Let's get it in the calendar. So we scheduled it for that coming Saturday. December 16th was the day. Of course, I know all these dates because they were so profound. I woke up that morning. It was a Saturday morning. I went in and did this echocardiogram. The person who ran it, after she finished, she had like a little bit of a weird look on her face. And she goes, hang on a second. She ran to the other room. She was gone for five, 10 minutes. She came back and goes, okay, I put a call into your doctor. I'm sure you'll be hearing from him soon. Um, but for now, you're good to go. And so I left. My wife and I left straight from this appointment. We went to a party. It was holiday time. We went to an afternoon holiday luncheon seeing a bunch of friends that we hadn't seen many since before my cancer diagnosis. They were all excited to see me, we're hugs and hellos and we're eating lunch and we're having a great time. And then at one point I walked away to use the bathroom and I took out my phone just to see, I had my phone turned off and I had three missed calls and voicemails from the cardiologist. And then the phone rings again while it's in my hand and it's him again. He's like, where are you? And I'm like, I'm at a party. He's like, no, you gotta leave, man. You gotta get to the hospital. I'm like, why? I feel fine. He's like, no. Say goodbye, get your stuff, head straight to the ER. They're gonna be expecting you. He didn't tell me any more information. I was like, all right, I guess we're gonna go. So I told my wife, we told everybody at the party, nice to see you, we gotta go to the hospital, apparently something's up. So we eventually get back to the hospital. I walk in, now if anybody has ever gone to the ER, you know, you walk in and it's like, you gotta go through paperwork and talk to them, and triage and wait for hours, and they finally see you. I walked in, I was like, hi, I'm Justin. They're like, come with us. Okay, that's never happened before. I went straight into the back, they checked me in, they started hooking me up right away, and the door swings open and two heart surgeons walk in in their street clothes, it's a Saturday. They were on call. My cardiologist was literally, he told me later, when I saw him later, that he didn't wanna worry me about what this was. And instead he was calling all the best heart doctors he could find on call to get some people over to the hospital because I was gonna need surgery apparently. They came in and told me that I was having cardiac tamponade, which is a form of a widow maker. You don't know what that means. Um, essentially, my heart sack had filled up with a liter of fluid and my heart was collapsing inside of itself. And they, so they said, we need to get you into surgery immediately and drain this because your heart is already collapsing and you're going to be dead within a couple hours if we don't do it. That was the day that I literally like, came closest to dying. Literally, the, through my, my whole journey, I was never concerned about dying. Even that day, I really wasn't aware of how close I was. But that day, on the other side of cancer, supposedly, was the day I came closest to it. My wife told me later that she was freaking out because they told her that this is very serious and they called a widow maker. And so she had to wait you know, in the lobby while they tried to save my life. They rushed me in. They said, okay, we're gonna prep you. When was the last time you ate? And I'm like, less than an hour ago, I was just at a lunch party. They're like, oh, we can't sedate you or put you under. So you're gonna to have to be awake the whole time we do this procedure. So I got to stay awake and watch them puncture my chest, feed the tubes into my heart wall and drain a liter of fluid out. That was an interesting adventure. We got through it, we saved my life, went up into the hospital room. A week later, I had to have another surgery. They were afraid the cancer had spread into my heart. They weren't sure why I had this complication. They wanted to create a pericardial window. So they went in this time, I got the uh, opening on the side. They didn't have to cut the opening in the middle, they entered from the side. And they went in there and they tested the, the tissue. There was no cancer, thank goodness. But what had happened was some blood clots formed around the outside of my heart wall. And my heart and my left lung had fused together. And that created that 
barrier that, that the, the sac flew, filled with fluid. So they dissected the organs, they separated them, and they cut a hole at the bottom of my heart sac. It's about a silver dollar size for those that know US currency. And they cut that hole out at the bottom of my heart sac. That way I had a permanent drain. So if it ever filled up with fluid again, it would just drain into my belly and be reabsorbed by my body. I was in the hospital for two weeks. I was released just the day before New Year's Eve, New Year's Eve, happy 2018. And then I was like ready to go to start my, the rest of my life. However, that heart situation kicked my butt and I had nothing left in the tank. I was so drained physically. I had lost so much weight. I was down to like 134 pounds at that point and I had no energy. I couldn't even walk up a flight of stairs on my own. So literally I was in really bad situation as far as my recovery. Although I did get my testing done that month and I was officially declared cancer free. So January, 2018, I officially became cancer free. But as my oncologist told me that I was really at the halfway point because the recovery started then. And boy, she was right. I didn't realize how like challenging, because to this day, I'm still not fully recovered. You know, now we're 2022, it's been over four years since I was declared cancer free. And I still have side effects that I deal with. And I still have some challenges with stamina at times, but I've been working so hard to get my life back on track, my fitness, my diet, and all the practices I'm doing. Plus taking everything I went through and really turning it into mission. Because I just really determined during my journey that this was not about me. And that was one of the turning points I had somewhere on the middle ground of chemo was I realized that this wasn't about me. This was a much bigger thing that was happening. And the opportunity was not just to improve my life, but even bigger than that was to go out there and help as many people as I could, those with cancer and beyond. And so I knew that I was bestowed a great gift and also a responsibility and an opportunity to take everything I went through and turn it into inspiration, teaching, helping as many people as I could. And so I started doing speaking things right away. I was doing speaking for UCLA. I was doing speaking for other organizations. Um, I was starting to talk to cancer patients, just, you know, no charge, just being like a cancer coach. I still do this to this day. Um, people call me, my cousin, my sister, my mom, I have cancer diagnosis. I can get them on the phone with me. We talk, I provide safe space. If they want advice, or if they want to hear my philosophies, I share. Otherwise, I just give them love and healing and, and I, I offer whatever I can to help people through it. And I do that as much as I can. It's very rewarding. It's also very challenging. You know, not every cancer patient survives and definitely that comes par for the course. So I have helped a lot of patients make it. I have helped a lot of other patients who didn't, but at the same time, I'm always here to help as much as I can and wherever I can. And I just kept using everything I went through to turn it into mission. And I wrote a one man show in 28, late 2018. And I debuted it in 2019. It's called Embrace Love Free. And it was a 90 minute one man play with characters and comedy and poetry and music and everything I could put in there. Plus all the videos I edited into little clips. And I just told my cancer story and all the inspirational messages, but through a very theatrical, fun adventure that was this play. I performed it all through 2019. I would have kept going, but the world shut down in 2020. So I put a pause in it. I did edit together one of the versions though that we, we shot footage of and it is available on a private link. So if anybody out there wants to watch it, reach out to me, hit me up on my website, justinsandler.com and I'll be happy to send you a private link that you can watch the, the one man play on its own. Um, I started speaking more. I did my first TEDx talk in 2019. By the way, it got banned by the TED organization. That's a whole other story. Um, my story is very deep and I uncovered some things that I think weren't quite in line with what they kind of like to share and sell in their programming. But I did a talk live on their stage. I did a follow up TEDx talk in 2021, which was part of a virtual event. <clears throat> Excuse me, that talk also was banned. What can you do? But I owned that one myself and I did post it on YouTube. So if you go to, to YouTube and search for Justin Sandler TED Talk, you will find it, it is there. And anything I can do to kind of share the mission and the message, that's what I'm working on. And now I'm in the middle of writing my book and that is the next step. <clears throat> now I'm gonna brace for some water because I feel like I've been talking for five hours. That's good. So um, what will be your message to the survivors and caregivers out there? Sorry, say your question one more time. Sorry, what will be your message to the cancer survivors and caregivers out there? My message? Well, 
as I've been sort of telling through the whole story, you know, the, the embrace love free philosophy, that is, that is the big message, right? That's the message I want everyone to learn because no matter if you're the cancer patient, the cancer caregiver, or just another human being walking on the street who's dealing with a problem and challenge, an obstacle in their life, try flipping it on its head. Try viewing your obstacle as an opportunity. Try saying, okay, I'm facing this, this cancer, or my, my beloved has cancer. How can we accept and embrace this cancer? Then how can we love and give gratitude to the situation we are in, vibrating at that love level? And if we can put this all together, how can we eventually get past this and free this obstacle and take with it its lesson learned and move forward to help other people? My advice to cancer patients and caregivers is always come from gratitude, always come from a space of love, always try to seek the opportunity in everything. Be gentle on yourself because there's going to be hard days. Be gentle. Have compassion for yourself. If you're a caregiver, have compassion for yourself as well. As a caregiver, it's very important to take care of yourself. A lot of people don't really do that or realize that. That's why one of the, in the missions of what we're doing, my wife and I are about to make a documentary film. We were supposed to start shooting it uh, in late 2017, but then my heart situation happened. And then by the time I was recovered, the world shut down. So now we're getting ready to start shooting it. It's called Caregiving Cancer. If you want to learn a little more about it, caregivingcancer.org is the website we have currently set up where we're raising some funds. But the idea is that we are making a film that is specifically geared towards the caregivers of cancer patients. There's not much out there for caregivers. Caregivers are like the forgotten heroes. They're overlooked. And so a cancer patient is going through a lot, of course. But that's all they have to worry about is going through what they're going through. The caregiver is caregiving, is doing the caring, for the patient is taking care of a lot of times the business and the bills and the home is worried about their love you know their loved ones and trying to keep themselves fed and bathed and cared for and a lot of caregivers forget to do that they'll go days without showering they won't they'll skip meals they'll go into debt because they're not able to manage their money properly or work properly they don't do some of the activities that are so necessary and a lot of times they don't do it because they feel they can't or shouldn't or maybe have guilt around not taking care of themselves. But if a caregiver doesn't take care of themselves first, they'll never be able to be fully present and there enough to take care of their loved one. So go easy, be gentle, try to find the love and gratitude in everything, take really good care of yourself, and therefore you can take good care of the others. So please, my advice to everybody, do things care of yourself in the highest order diet nutrition exercise whatever spiritual practices or philosophies or emotional practices you can do just dive in and do them all because they're all going to help it's like all the tools in your bag you're facing this one problem but you have all these tools that you can choose from so it's so great to have all these tools to draw from and therefore your huge obstacle while life-changing life-threatening whatever it may be you'll be able to face it from a much higher vibration than just being like, I hope I live, or I hope my, my patient lives, or gosh, let's just get through this, or, you know, it's so heavy. So try to flip it on its, on its head. Try to flip the script. And try to find the love and gratitude in everything. And that's some of my biggest piece of advice. That was great, Justine. So thank you so much for being a part of the session today. So I'm really sure that okay so the survivors and the caregivers out there will get really motivated by watching your journey and it was such an inspiring journey so i don't have any words to say to you so hats off to you thank you so much thank you i really appreciate you having me i love all the work that you guys are doing at san anko thank you for your work uh, you know i wish i would have learned about it when i was going through it but different resources that thank you're you. providing the different ways of thinking that your website has like it's really great and i'm going to share this with people now but i'm you know i'm aware of it as well so thank you for what you do for everybody out there who's watching this i send you all my love all my healing energy if i can ever be of any help to anyone please reach out like again if you go to justinsandler.com there's a contact page 
send me a message here on social media. You can find me at Justin Sandler on almost every social media site. Reach out to me. Let me know how I can support you. Um, sure, my talks are out there and everything else is available. But if there's anything I can do, um, and I'm almost done with writing my book. So when that's done, I'll be sharing that as well. So yes, please um, take care of yourselves. And let me know how I can support you. But in the meantime, I send you peace, love, and healing. And I hope to see some of you soon. Thank you.